us Italians would say Saita. 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 Yeah. My parents were James Saita, and my maiden name was uh, Anna Maria Papani. So we're just a couple of Italians talking about right. our journey with food addiction today. And uh, I think it's uh, very cultural for us, James. What do you think? I mean, I think Italians get obsessed about food, and I'm talking about whether we're thin or we're heavy. Sure. It's like just such a, an obsession. Yeah, I, uh, w we spoke a little bit earlier today and you talked about um, our identity being in food. And, and I, I thought about for the last 47 years that I remember going to my Nana's house and it's, here's Biscolte, here's Muchadale, you know, here's eat, 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 manja, manja, manja all the time. And, uh, and it's comforting and, and it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, we're always around the table breaking bed bread you know and it shouldn't be bread <laughs> but that's what we're usually eating pasta and bread for sure yes yeah. and uh you know i told you about my dad growing up having uh you know he had barber shops in san francisco and he would even have a clawfoot tub in the window growing sometimes strawberries sometimes basil but anywhere he could plant some food he had it growing and any day off was spent you know going to farmers markets outside of the city or going to Chinatown because they were having a shipment of some produce or something and something was always simmering stewing or bubbling or boiling on the on the stove all the time I have an aunt that says you know she smell of garlic on other people's breath you know, <laughs> so it's just that kind of thing that I am going to go ahead and do share screen real quick. And uh, so that I can show everybody your kind of your before and after picture. And then we can just, you know, tell me about this here. Tell me about, you know, what was your impetus to uh, change your life? You know, that picture is, is funny because um, I actually wore a robe with with slippers and you can't see in that picture but the slippers have a left and a right on them i got them for christmas and of course that's christmas time and um, i wore a robe to arby's to eat too much of the wrong thing like always just to kind of embarrass my kids and uh, as if that wasn't enough there's a little bell there that you're supposed to ring for good service just to really embarrass them and but you know if you look at that picture you look at me smiling there but I mean, that's really that's somebody that's just given up and, and that's really where I was. I was like, I can't change this. There's nothing's going to get better for me. I might as well just leave the house in a robe, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's very sad. I, I have, I, I usually look at that picture in the past and I've gotten emotional because I can't believe I let myself, you know, uh, uh, get that way. But it's, you know, it's just like the, the, the analogy or metaphor of the, the frog and the, the hot water, it jumps right out, but it put the, in, the, in the cold water and just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And I put on, you know, 10 pounds a year of my first 12, mar uh, you know, years of marriage. And before you know it, I'm, you know, 400 pounds, almost 400 pounds. And it's just, it's, it's disgusting is what it is. But at the same time, it's, it's tragic and it's sad. And um, journey wise, um, so it's been a year and about four or five months would have been last February, March. I started losing my eyesight at times of the day. It was it would get really blurry, and um, you know, I thought that was interesting because it would go in and out and in and out, and one eye was worse than the other or something. And and of course, I've in the winter time, I I'm in construction, so I don't do a, a ton of work anyway. So I just was sleeping all the time, just super tired, super lethargic, uh, joints hurt, and everything hurt all the time. And my kids are worried about me. My wife's worried about me. And, and so I just went to the doctor and I had already been diagnosed type 2 diabetic for a couple of years, but I completely ignored it. I didn't take any of the meds. Um, like a typical husband or a guy, I don't listen, you know, and just being stupid. And so I, um, you know, she just said, listen, so this is April 29th when I finally went in. And she said, okay, um, your blood sugar is 527 today. Your A1C is 15 something. Uh, 157, I think, or 159. Um, and of course, my triglycerides have always been high. My LDL has been super high. My HDL has been super low, all that, all that jazz. And um, the ratios have been all bad. And, and she said, okay, you are now insulin resistant. You now have to take injections and you need to take 2000 milligrams of metformin every day, or you're going to die. And, you know, she was really blunt. She's basically saying, you're an idiot. I've told you what to do. You've ignored me. And now this is what you have to do. And 
So I kind of went home and had a little cry and I ran into a Jay and he literally just like hits me on the shoulder and like, you know what you should do? Try keto. And that was pretty much it at that time. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I went home and just tried keto. And for some reason, um, I hear a lot of folks that are trying keto like, oh, I've tried it and I was on it. And, and so I, I think I just was ready. I, I tried it before and I wasn't for some reason it worked. And then I, I realized that it's one of the, the words, the key buzzwords is sustainable. It is so ridiculously sustainable. And for me, it was easy for an Italian. It was easy because there's all the things I like to eat, but the, 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 the change was basically, I'm going to die if I don't change. And that, so it was a pretty good, that was my why as we were going to maybe well, talk about later. And you know, um, that's very telling what you said about that picture of you. I did not realize that was in a fast food chain. I have literal goosebumps right now thinking about that. You were literally probably using humor and kind of, you know, laughing at yourself to yeah. cover the pain that you were experiencing and then go to the shame. Uh, which, you know, and I believe that addiction is a disease like cancer. It's not something that you ask for, you know, and the inability to stop eating. Some of that is, you know, wire, hardwired into us because it used to be there were times of scarcity and then times of plenty. And so we would naturally gorge ourselves in order to survive. And the problem is now we can get access to anything 20 seven. So now in this modern world with modern foods, it's more difficult for people like us that probably kept the human race alive back in the day. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a really incredible part of your story and running into Jay Morales and uh, I'll, I'll put a link to his Facebook page. What is it called? I can't remember. Um, do you know what the Facebook page is called? Yeah. His is no keto, K N O W. Right, keto. right. No keto. And it's just a nice little support page. It's, uh, and he helped. Well, I met you at Keto Omaha yes. and he helped yes. put that together. And we met over salami, go figure, right? Okay. <laughs> Italians hitting the salami tray, right? So, you know, one thing that I've realized too is it's okay as a person recovering from food addiction or whatever, or, eating keto to enjoy your meals and so to me that's very important and i found that i can do a lot of things italian like i was telling you eggs and in pasta sauce and i've had friends come over and say oh my gosh it tastes like like even better than lasagna because you poach the eggs right in the sauce and they're just lovely and great to eat and i always sit down with the intention i'm going to enjoy every bite of food that i eat i'm not going to act like I'm punishing myself. I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to worry about what I, I'm not going to say I can't eat this. I'm going to say, I won't eat things that harm me today. You know, and that's a, that's been a, a long time coming for me, but that's something that has made it easier for me. Um, how do you deal with your, your grandma, your mom, people that try to, you know, manja, manja, that want to feed you. What, what do you do or say that helps you cope with those kinds of moments? It's uh, a great question. I'll tell you what, I've been really blessed uh, with a family that loves me and they just appreciate that I'm doing something different. So I, I hate to say it, it's not going to be a good, good story for you, but they don't even offer me because they know I'm not going to eat it. And so it's been, it's probably helped a ton. Um, my, my, my Nana used to always say, and she still says, she's 96. She says, how can this be bad for you? It's like, well, because it's sugar and, you know, it, she'd say, but I made it with love. That's why, that's, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, you know? And, and so it's, you know, in the Christmas time, I'm going to have a biscotti. I'm going to have a piece of pizza or something that she makes. Uh, but, but, uh, um, and, and that's a, uh, an interesting part segue is that what I figured out for my journey is I was unable, I am unable to just take one bite of something that I'm not supposed to eat or something that I shouldn't eat. And so for, for the, the way that I've kind of experienced success is I just didn't eat anything other than what I could eat period. So I didn't, I didn't count my carbs. I just knew I wasn't going to eat them. And so I never got close to my 20 carb or 30 or whatever it was. I didn't count calories or macros. And that's one of the things that 
I think is so amazing about this, especially for someone that was like me, who's super morbidly obese, not just morbidly obese and not just obese, super morbidly obese that, um, and I think everyone's body is going to be different. I responded probably better than some might, uh, is that I didn't count calories and I didn't work out at all. I didn't, not one time. I just changed my diet. And one of the things that I commented on a, a post today is that regardless of where you are with Judeo-Christian or whatever, and you meaning anyone who's listening, is I asked myself, was that there when God made the earth? And if it's not, then I'm not going to eat it, you know? And, and, and so it makes, it, I'm sorry, what was that? God made it. It's okay if man made it, stay away. I don't know right. what you that, but I use that saying a lot. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So to your question, it's been probably easier than I thought it would be. Um, I, there's a couple of friends who are like, come on, man, kind of thing like that. But they saw the results so quickly and they were pretty drastic. Um, I, you know, I lost a hundred pounds from May to Thanksgiving. I, that's pretty quick. And, and, and I, 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 I really try to caution to not sound like I'm bragging because it's the furthest thing from bragging. It is just, I, I'm really, really grateful that that, uh, and I knew Jay because uh, our kids went to school together and stuff. I'm just really grateful that I, I call it an intersection where there was just a, a time, at the right time where he says, hey, you should try it. Because I was, even after my diagnosis, I was just as hopeless at that point. I was like, holy crap, um, you know, and I'll tell you what, with this COVID thing, having three or four core morbidities and all these different things, and I don't know all this stuff. It seems like it's maybe not as bad as it was or maybe it's worse. I don't really know. I'm not here to argue that, but I eliminated at least three of the risks. Yes. A, uh, basically almost a year before it came to town. And I don't think that's an accident. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't care about someone else more than he cares about me. It's just, I'm just grateful that I had that intersection at that time to, to, to lose that weight. And I just turned 47 Saturday. I'm long winded. So you have to cut me off like, like that. But uh, uh, Saturday and I was at lunch with a friend of mine And uh, I'm 47. Statistically, there's more years behind me than there are in front of me. I, it just dawned on me, and I, and I thought to myself, I am so glad that I'm over 100 pounds lighter and still going to go down. And that, that means I literally extended my life. And, yeah. and not a lot of people had that opportunity. And so I'm glad that I had it. And, and gosh, and I, and I appreciate what you're doing and what you do and your, your passion for it and I hope I can help you help people well I just as one personal story can touch someone tell me do you know what your a1c is now and and your LDL and HDL and all of that so uh, my a1c is 5.8 wow uh, yeah and I took my uh, what's what's amazing about that is it went from 15 7 to 9 in, in two months and then it, it kind of slowed down but it's been below six this entire, almost this whole year, it's been below six. And that uh, proves you don't have to be at your goal weight in order to be healthy because it really, it's two it's different exactly things. Right. You can be metabolically healthy and still have a few pounds on you. And that's superior to being thin and being metabolically unhealthy, which can also happen. Absolutely. The, the saying I'm sure you've heard that I, I tell people all the time is, I was fat on the outside and fat on the inside. Right. Now I'm fat on the outside and skinny on the inside versus fat on the outside, skinny on the inside. And so I would take fat outside, skinny inside any day. Because yes. you, you feel just the way you feel compared to before. Um, I think you and I are pretty close to the same age. And uh, you. I got a few years on you. Yeah. 55. Uh, but, but you know, when you get up to go potty after you get out of bed, you kind of walk in, you know, like this. And a year and a half ago, I could take 30 steps before I could walk up straight. And now when I get up in the morning, I stand up three or four steps. I'm fine. And that alone, I know is because of diet. They get rid of the inflammation, the seed oils and all the junk that we used to, I mean, the processed crap. That right. alone is worth it, honestly. Well, and just so the audience understands what a hemoglobin A1C measure is how sweet you are over the past three months. So each cell in your body um, gets glycated. That means it gets sugar coated. And so the hemoglobin A1C, it shows 
what your average blood sugar has been over three months. So the higher the number, the higher your corresponding blood sugar. And there are charts on uh, online that you can just Google and see, you can look up a 15 something A1C and see what your blood sugar was running. And I'm guessing that one's pretty darn high. You yeah, know, it was over 500. Yeah, so, so an average blood sugar of over 500. And the thing is, you can't really feel your blood sugar when you slowly get used to it, like that frog in a slow uh, boiling pot of water is a really good analogy. Because you also, then it'll feel like if your blood sugar comes down to even like, say, 300 from 500, that'll feel like you're crashing uh, just because you're so used to having a certain level of blood sugar. But it's, right. you know, it's, it's, it is reversible. And, uh, you know, I'm not allowed to say that you can cure your diabetes, but you can try. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm all for trying. I, I'll say it. I'll say it because I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I, I absolutely, and, and I just went to the, the doctor on Friday uh, about something unrelated. I uh, had a little surgery on my finger and, and she just sits there in shock. She just can't believe it. And she says, you literally, she said these words, you literally cured your diabetes by your diet. And she's, and of course, she's more shocked because she's seen me the last 15 years, the way I, I've eaten, the way I've eaten. And she's like, I just can't believe you did it. And I, sometimes I can't believe it either. And you, you used the, a term earlier, you said seven years for your body uh, to, to, to change, basically, from uh, being addicted. Is that what you said, seven years? Well, maybe seven years to really kind of, because for a true food addict, you know, food is about 10% of it. And you have really good support, it sounds like, with your family. And also, I mean, I think you had, and it's not for all people, but it does, it takes some time to, to know how to navigate the landmines. For instance, if you give up dope, you don't have to go to the dope man's house, but you still have to go to Thanksgiving, you have to go to Christmas, whatever your holiday is you know, uh, bar mitzvahs, it doesn't matter what religion you are, somebody's gonna have some food for you, you know, and there's gonna be people that make something for you. And one thing that helps me is like, maybe I'll go to church and someone will say, oh, I made you a gluten-free dessert because they know I have celiac. You know, not everybody knows I'm a food addict. So I just say, thank you. That's so, so kind of you to think of me. And then I go about and eat whatever I can eat that I want to eat, you know, that's within my food plan. And nobody's the wiser, you know, I don't have to hurt somebody's feelings or, or I can say to them, I, if, if they are going to see me, I can be like, I so appreciate your concern for me and trying to provide something for me, but I'm better off if I stay away from those things and I'm here for the company or something like that, you know, really, really help. but it is it's a process to, uh, to be able to navigate um, relapses able to navigate staying on plan not getting back into that carb creep you know to come to accept right. that one bite is too many for some of us and a thousand is never enough you know that's a great way of saying it i i i you know i have kids like a lot of us do and i one of my daughters when she would get in trouble get grounded on the way to her bedroom, she figures, you know what, I'm already in trouble. And she just knocks stuff off a counter. Like, what are you going to do to me? I'm already in trouble. And that's kind of, I think, a, a, a lot of us do that when it comes to eating stuff we're not supposed to. We're like, well, I already feel like crap. I've already eaten 3,000 calories. What's another 10,000? And I mean, I, I've, I've sat with a box of ice cream sandwiches and just eaten one after another, after another, and then got up. And I'm telling you, I used to, I used to, uh, eat those banquet TV dinners back when I first was in college or get moved back to Nebraska. And while I was heating those dollar banquet dinners up in the microwave, I would eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then I would eat the banquet dinner and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and get up, put it in the microwave and eat another one. And we're talking 10 sandwiches, 10 dinners, insane amount of food. And I, but you know, to put it in the words of John Candy from the movie Stripes. For some people, you know, that some people start keto and they fail at keto because the underlying problem is not being addressed. You seem to have understood that there's an addiction component for you and kind of managed that 
where some people, they, they don't even see that. They think that it's a moral problem and they, they feel like I can, just can't stick to my plan. And so they fail to come to acceptance that their problem is certain foods are very psychoactive for them. In fact, I can tell you that I actually bought a spice from, uh, from I think it was TJ Maxx a while back. And I'm very careful. I read everything, you know, is there sugar? Is there gluten? Is there, you know? And so I read it and then I, I got home that night and I thought, well, I'll put that on some fish, you know? And so I made the fish and I sat down to eat and I took one bite and I was like, I felt kind of weird. And I took another bite and it was like fireworks were going off back here. And I double checked the label and there's sugar in it. And I hadn't had sugar for so long, my body knew it. And my dopamine was just firing on the 4th of July. I, I didn't even finish my fish. I know that might sound funny to some people, but I could feel the pull of the sugar. I could feel like, like it would be like an alcoholic accidentally having a couple of sips of beer or something. You know, that was the feeling for me. It was waking up that, I call it, I call my disease the cookie monster. You know, because <laughs> kind of like what you said, yeah. you know, we just want to just shove food down our pie hole and there is no stopping me. I used to go to the movies, eat my uh, husband's candy, eat my kid's candy and not share mine. You know, that's like, that's the kind of addict I am. Like, I'm going to eat yours and I'm going to eat mine for myself, you know. And on the outside, people probably didn't think I was an addict, but I was also over exercising to keep some of that under control you know i was i was and i was uh doing diet of the week so a lot of addicts they try to manage their food addiction you know with with other kind of co-addictions but i want to show you something because we had talked about it when we were speaking or er together early and i as a as a recovering addict with 31 years clean off of drugs also believe this to be true and bitten johnson says it all the time that Sugar is a gateway drug. So I'm just going to show a, a, a video that I love that one, of my, that one of my colleagues had posted a while back and I had never seen it. And it's Eric Clapton on 60 Minutes from 1999 talking about uh, addiction. Without doing something to alter my consciousness. And it started with heroin. It started, no, it started with sugar. Sugar. Oh, yeah. When I was five, six years old, I was cramming sugar down my throat as fast as I could get it done. Sweets, you know, sugar on bread and butter. I became addicted to sugar because it changed the way I felt. And as the years passed, Clapton... I find that to be very powerful. And uh, I actually use this tool called the Sugar Tool. I'm certified in it uh, from Bitten Johnson. And it maps out your whole sugar addiction. And in mine, it showed that I was a sugar addict from the time I was three. That's when I could remember it expressing myself. But I told my mother about it. And Bitten had asked me if I had been bottle fed, and I was. Because back then, they would give the woman a shot to dry them up and not even give them the choice of nursing. And there's all kinds of corn syrup, and everything in formula. And apparently, my mom had to take me to the hospital because she thought I had jaundice. But what it was, was, it was baby food carrots. And baby food carrots are one of the sweetest baby foods you could eat. And I wouldn't yeah. eat anything except for baby food carrots. And that was as an infant. So even as an infant, I was craving sweets. And for me, my story goes, at nine years old, I was using drugs. And you can see on my sugar scale, when I did it with Bitten Johnson, where I have a flat line, like when I was using drugs, food wasn't being used. And I've seen it where people were gambling. So all of this addiction, interactive disorder. So I, I mean, I just want to put it out there that if you have any addiction that you've identified uh, and you are having, and you're still struggling and feeling like not well, food might be an issue that you could look at. You know, I'm not saying it is for everyone. It's worth taking a look at. Uh, and uh, thank you, David Wolf, for posting that video. I found that just so refreshing to see that somebody understands uh, on a deep level how chemically affected we get, you know. But the thing is, at some point, it's not satisfying, is it? So that picture of you in the robe, 
that, that is like the end of the road. That is like, you're not, you're not even enjoying eating and you're literally eating food almost against your will. Yeah. That. That's true. That's true. I, I like the, uh, uh, we, we talked about earlier and you kind of reiterated about the, the addiction to side and not being a moral issue because that's how I've always seen it. And I think a lot of folks that have a food addiction, they make all kinds of other excuses for why they're not doing what they're supposed to do and why they're doing stuff they're not supposed to do. And, I, and, and I've got a litany of them, but, but I, I, to be able to be enlightened or woke, I think is the word people use, to, 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 that it's a real addiction, as real as anything else, and it's a real disease as real as anything else. It takes away that, a little bit of that guilt component because guilt and shame, more important, shame, Shame is so horrible for us, and it's it's so uh, bad for our psyche. And I, I, I used to tell my, my wife when I was at three hundred or three fifty. I'd say I can see how people because we watched that six hundred pound live show, uh, or she did anyway, a lot. And I, I can see how people get from three hundred to six hundred like that because you don't feel like moving, and you feel bad about whatever reason, and, and barring any kind of injury. In my case, I actually broke my back. So I put a, a lot of weight on as a result of that, but uh, I actually broke it twice, <laughs> but um, I was already heavy. So that's not my excuse. Um, but but to, to, you could see how it happens because you don't feel well enough to do anything and you feel bad. And then you're like, well, there's nothing I can do anyway. I'm not going to eat because it makes me feel better. Then you feel guilty about that in that cycle and that cycle. And it's 10 years or excuse me, one year, 10 pounds, and one year, 15 pounds, and, and then you're so far gone, uh, to quote Randy Travis, too gone for too long, and then you're like, screw it, and, and, I, and I, I can tell you that I'm going to reveal something that's going to sound absolutely horrible, but I, I hope people can see my, my, uh, my vulnerability is that my mother was super morbidly obese most of my childhood. She actually had gastric bypass, and was one of the few successful, but my, my, the way that I've identified heavy people, including myself, is lazy and no discipline. And because of the way that she was, she hated herself. She's not a very pleasant person. Um, I love her, but it is what it is. Um, that's how I identified it. And it, it took getting to where I was, hating myself and hating other people because of something that's, and I don't want to say it's not their fault, but that, that real addiction, where now I look at someone who was heavy like I was. And the first thing I think of is I can help that person. That's the very first thing I think of. And of course, you don't walk up to a stranger and go, hey, you're super over the obese. I was too. You, you know, it, you, you just find a way to, to communicate. And I tell you what, I, I look at folks that were like me and I can just see the sadness in their eyes yes. and the hopelessness. And that hopelessness is what you know, makes me emotional and passionate to be able to if, if and you said one story, it's, it's really cliche when people say, well, I can just help one person, but literally it's, it's one person and then one more person and one more person. And, and not, and, and I think that for me, I want everyone to start doing it exactly the way I did it and see my success. And so I have to be careful and not getting A, offended or B, feel rejected because it's not going to, everyone's going to do it just the way I do, because everyone's body is different. And, um, but, but there's a, a amazing satisfaction and gratification in somebody, a light going off when yeah. you, you can identify a problem and they're like, oh, that's what I think. Oh, that's what I do. Or that's what I did. And they're like, they see that picture of me and, and, and they identify with feeling, I just gave up. I'm giving up. I can't do anything about it. And they're like, well, look at this fat. So, and, and I, I use these terms jokingly, because that's what people who are fat or do, they make jokes about it. And, and that's what I used to do. And, and it's like, this guy can do it, I can do it. Well, and I think you know, we're, it's such an uphill battle because we're surrounded by you know, food pictures. We're surrounded by, you know, now you go to the checkout lane at Walmart and it's, it's literally like going down another grocery store aisle. It's not yeah. just short it's the big long aisle and you have to run the gauntlet every time you go and these food manufacturers they're 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 hiring people to make it addictive on purpose they want you you know remember bet you can't eat just one they want you hooked oh, yeah. they want you coming back for more 
They want your money. They don't care about your health, you know? So there's that whole thing, realizing that, that you can't open a bag of certain foods that are meant to trigger your dopamine, especially if you're an addict and think you're going to be able to have an off button and think you're going to be able to be, um, um, be able to moderate certain foods. And so that's where a lot of people trip up too, I think. But I also think the compassion that you have to learn to have for yourself and others, you wouldn't say to someone with cancer, you know, even if they smoked to get the cancer, because you know the cigarette is addictive and you know they probably didn't think they would get addicted. They thought they would be different. They thought they could just smoke one cigarette or whatever. You're not going to be, oh, how did you allow yourself to get cancer, you dummy, you know, or whatever. You're not going to do that. You're going to have compassion for people. And I think uh, just allowing someone to understand, I don't think it's anybody's fault if they're heavy. I think it's the fault of some faulty dietary guidelines that we have, you know, on a 2000 calorie diet, the, they say we should have, you know, 60% of our calories from diet or from carbohydrates. That's, you know, uh, like 1200 or 1600 calories, 1200 calories, I think worth of carbohydrates. This girl would blow up like a balloon and I would be in pain and I would be wanting more carbohydrates all the time. And I'd be displacing really high value nutrient dense food, which helps me feel calm and helps me overcome my cravings and overcome my, you know, my compulsive thinking about food. One thing that I love about the freedom of eating a very low carb diet, and I'm mostly carnivore, is that I don't think about food all the time. And I think more about like, when I, when I set the table for dinner, I make it about spending time with my family. And like I said, I sit down with the intention, I'm going to enjoy my meal and I'm going to prepare a meal that I, everyone's going to like. That's important to me. But we're going to sit there and we're going to communicate and we're going to have connection, you know, and it's not going to be any of this fake joking around stuff or the mask I used to wear. Value me because I'm such a good cook. Value me because I feed you so well. Value me because you can't get food better than, in a restaurant than you get from Anna Maria Papani, you know, because that, it, there was a lot of ego and a lot of like um, people pleasing for me as a, an Italian woman preparing that food with love. You said that earlier. I, my, my two older kids grew up, I would say, what's the main ingredient, babies? And they would say, love, mama. <laughs> love is yeah. the ingredient. Yeah. It doesn't taste good without love. And I stand by that. When I, when I prepare my food, I'm grateful for God, thank you for, you know, making cows so I can have this ribeye steak, <laughs> you know? I'm like, I get that, that attitude of gratitude, and then I perfectly prepare that meat to my specific taste, you know? I make sure that it's, you know, medium rare through and through. If I have to sous vide it, whatever I have to do to make it. So it is here. I'm taking good care of the resources I've got, and I'm going to enjoy what I'm eating, but it's not the same. It's not the... It's not about me. It's not about what can I get out of food. So food for me was manipulation. It was, I'd eat breakfast and I'd think, what can I have for lunch? Of course, I'd be grazing all day anyway. So <laughs> I don't know why I thought I was going to wait until lunch to eat, you know? And so just yeah. not like the space in my brain, you know? The hamster wheel about what am I going to eat? When can I eat again? How much can I get away with eating? Can I, I, I would hide food from people, stash wrappers, put something in the trash, take it out of the trash because I changed my mind. You know, all kinds of behaviors that- I've never done that. I've never done that. Never done that. <laughs> well, don't say yet because you, know, you never know. I did, I, did, I was lying. I was, I was, I, I have done it. I, I, I can tell you, I, I don't have the, the victory that you have and, and yet. Um, again, we're talking 14, 15 months into it, but, but um, uh, following pe people like you, and, and there's some folks uh, that are on the low carb or uh, high fat in that are probably a little aggressive for, for my taste and vulgar and profane and stuff. But there's one thing that Dr. Tro said one time that uh, he, he put a video on, you might've seen it, where he was talking about being on a cruise ship. Um, and he, he said, uh, I realized that I might be, I might be 
to the food the rest of my life. I might have this problem. And for me, that was really powerful because this was right before COVID. So it was like February and my weight had plateaued. I lost 122 pounds and I hadn't, wasn't losing anymore. I wasn't gaining. And I was, I, of course, I started thinking, oh, you screwed it up again. You've done something wrong. You're not doing it right. And uh, it was okay to, to, to learn to be okay that, hey, this is a real problem. It's not just bad decisions all the time, which it, it is also, but this is, this is something that's a, a, a real, it, no different than having, you know, black hair and, and whatever. It's, yeah. it's, it's, who, it's part of who I am. And, and so to be able to, to reframe it, and, and really you've kind of reinforced that today, and I appreciate that, um, to be able to reframe it that it's not, it doesn't have to define me, but it's still part of who I am. And, and being able to identify it both cognitively and in my heart, you can, it kind of helps you take a, a, um, a, I guess, a path forward, a direction forward. Yes, and I think that's a very good point about the black hair or whatever. I always say you can't control what color your eyes are. You can't control whether you're born pretty or ugly. You can't control, you know, whether you go prematurely gray or you get to keep your black hair, you know. And I truly believe that addiction is something you can control. I think abstinence has to come before recovery and abstinence from the drug foods, then your food plan might change as you go along. Like you might find out that, you know, as you go along, well, maybe I need to tweak some things, you know, depending on what's going on with you. Or we had talked about eating too much of anything and you had talked about, you know, yeah. eat too much steak. I can, uh, you know, that, that, feeling of wanting to gorge ourselves or whatever, even on something healthy that is on our plan. Uh, that can be a, a barrier to reaching our goals sometimes. So that kind of self-honesty, it, it just, I think it's ongoing and we have to tell the truth to ourselves about ourselves. And I think it's helpful to tell the truth to ourselves about ourselves and to another person, because then we, you know, we say sure. it and it's out there and someone that cares about what we're doing will say, okay, so what do you think uh, could be a solution to that? And then you start thinking about, well, maybe I should weigh and measure for a few days and just, you know, not, not try to not eat as much, but see how much, what am I really putting in my body? You know, get some honesty and clarity around that. And then you could see, oh, wow, you know, I'm probably eating about 600 calories more than I need to Maybe I should trim that down a bit. And then you can monitor yourself a little bit for a while and see if you can kind of, uh, you know, stick to a way that's going to be, like you said, I really needs to be sustainable. I, I, don't, I don't think, I think that for where you're at right now, you have metabolic health. And as a health coach, what I would say to you, slow is better because the tortoise and the hare, you're in this right. to live and enjoy your life. And so, you know what? A half a pound a year is over 25 pounds a year. Think about right. that. A half a pound a week is 25 pounds a year. And that is not difficult to do, you know? And so to me, that, that would be a better state of mind for someone. And of course, it's not gonna have, happen in a straight line. Like you're, you don't just right. go, go like this. And also remembering that muscle weighs more than fat and when you're eating higher protein with keto you could be you could very well be losing fat so i think measuring is a really good tool and when i say that i mean take a measure supplement around your belly button or better yet just get a piece of string and and measure your height and then fold the string in half and if you can fit it around you or the closer you get those two folded and a half ends around you then you know you're lost visceral fat which is what you want to lose that's a, a great point and i kind of forgot about that but but um uh, when when i first kind of started plateauing um i've actually my weight's gone up but my waist size has gone down there you and go so um i started at a 48 and i wore 38s but i technically am like 12 pounds heavier at my lowest uh, Wait, I'm still wearing 38s today, and and so and I and I I'm not advocating not working out, but I I mean I I'm in construction, so I have a physical job, 
Um, I don't do a ton of physical work anymore, but I'm still, I'm active and, and I run from early in the morning to the end of the day. Um, but, uh, so, but obviously the byproduct is more muscle than, um, than, uh, than fat because I've, uh, I, I, um, I mean, I'm still wearing the, what do you call it? The, it's the same size pants. And so my goal is, my goal is only a 36. Right. Because that's kind of what I was wearing uh, when my wife and I um, w w first got married. But what's interesting about protein versus fat is that I'm still 40 pounds more than when we first um, when we first got married, even though I was, uh, you know, only one more dress size away. So it's, it's, right. it's proof positive. And you can see this image. This is an image I share with clients all the time. Body recomposition is a real thing. And that's what we're talking about here. This is the exact same weight of muscle compared to fat. So um, don't let the scale determine who you are ever. Don't let, don't let a number on the scale tell you who you are today. That I call you. You are a specially and wonderfully made human being. I believe in a higher power, and I believe God made us on purpose for a purpose. And it wasn't to put ourselves down and live in guilt and shame and live in fear over a stupid number on a scale, you know? So I think, you know, really knowing and arming yourself with an education about how the human body really works, that helps you understand the miracle of, of uh, what our body is capable of doing and it will express health and you will come the way your, your body is supposed to be or the composition your body is supposed to be if you consistently one plate of food at a time, one bite at a time, stick to foods that you know are not going to harm you, you know, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about the, the mental harm, that, that guilt and shame, boy, that, that weighs you down, I think, more than a number on the scale. Absolutely. It's it's the real poison, the real evil, absolutely. And I I, I keep it, it sounds like cliche, but I keep thinking about the the real battle here is is, is between our ears, you know, and, and then the longest distance right between our heart and our head. Uh, that's where the the real real battle is. And and um, it's one thing to be addicted to food, or it's one thing to really really like food, but it's another to. Um, I told you that story uh, a couple of years ago. What's funny is that I. I'm fortunate to have kind of figured out that I had a food addiction before I started doing anything about it mm -hmm. versus starting keto and then failing because, Oh, I'm actually addicted to food. It's not just that I'm uh, morally bankrupt or something. And it was a, there was a stressor, something got me upset and I was sitting with one of my employees and I immediately said, Oh man, we should go get some burgers. And he's like, we just ate, you know? And then I was able to cognitively realize, Holy crap. I'm not even hungry. My body just thinks I'm hungry because I'm stressed out. And of course it's been, it's more than two years, actually. It's been three years. So I'm a slow learner, but, but uh, it's, it's taken that time to, to, to remind myself that this is a real thing. And, and again, I sound like, uh, 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 you know, you just reinforce it again, that, that it's, it's a real, real disease that we have to, we, it, it, you know, it's a monster. It's a real monster that we have to, to accept. You know? And it's not just some, elephant in the corner it's that the, or it's the gorilla in the room and and yes and it's inside of me like for me I, my disease wakes up before i do and it's like okay anna what are we going to do today and then i get up and i need to make a decision am i going to go with my old patterns of thinking that are so deeply ingrained within me or am i going to start my day with you know some meditation so I like to take a little walk and I'm talking about moseying this morning. I walked because it's beautiful outside. I walked for about an hour and a half. I talked to a client on the phone, talked to a friend on the phone and I was doing like 19 minute miles. I don't care. I was, I was having a good time just moseying. I'm not trying to exercise. I, I just, movement is it like meditation to me, you know? So what do you do to de-stress? Cause those are some of the things I do to de-stress. Um, that's a great question. I, I, I've, I've commented for the last couple of years that I haven't figured it out yet. Um, on a Saturday morning, um, I really watched, love watching PBS. Um, that's about the only thing I can, during the week they don't, and it's a shame that they don't have the cool shows they have on Saturday morning, but um, I like watching This Old House. I love watching America's Test Kitchen. 
right. tell you the best show, if you guys haven't watched it, is Rick Steves Europe. I love that show. His voice is so calming. It's the most calming show. And uh, that's one of the things that, that I can do. Any kind of nature show for me really kind of gets me, you know, I start at about 5 a.m. and I go to about 9 p.m. every day. And so I don't, I need to really work on that. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked me that because I need to be able to do that every day, some kind of de-stressor. I, I'm not good at that. And, and, then, and then on the weekend, I'm just, you know, and so they're, 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 that, that's a good question. What should I do? Why don't you answer that on the spot? Well, I, don't, I don't know. You should uh, put yourself on your list and don't be such a human doing, be a human being. Like don't live to work, work to live, you know? Like you, it sounds- I'm stealing like, that. I'm stealing that from you. I'm writing it down right now. I probably stole it from someone else, so feel free. But you talked about your daughter that knocked shit off of the cabinet. Sorry for using the cuss word, but you know, I mean- It's what it was. I, it's I exactly what it was. I love this already because part of being an addict is being a rebel, you know, and I think sometimes we, um, we also, we just never learned to like, just slow down, just take a minute. You know, I suggest to some of my clients just to even like put a little timer on their phone where it reminds them to just take 15, you know, on a, until it becomes a habit. And I think even doing that, like uh, I know you work and you're and you're physical and everything, but I'll bet you you could shut off your phone for 15 minutes a day, go sit in your car or go take a, a light walk or something for 15 minutes, just something where you're just like separating yourself, decompressing, you know, set an intention to go home and be fully present with your family. Don't be, you know don't be doing things that can wait until tomorrow the world isn't going to crumble if you don't get every single thing done for work and that's something that i've had to learn because the connections that i have with my family and my friends they feed me more than any sugar or grain or you know nasty old treat that i used to think that i loved ever did you know, and I literally see like a skull and crossbones on the foods that I know hurt me now. Like that's one of my, one of my things through taking the time for myself that I've realized I can change my thinking, but I got to give myself time to do that, you know? And I think too, like the kind of life I want to live, um, now that I have space in my head, I don't want to replace it with some other addiction. I don't want to replace it with being, you know, a workaholic or this aholic or whatever. And we can do that addiction interaction dance. You know, it's one disease, many outlets. So for me, putting that time into my day when I just, you know, I'm not gonna be a human doing, I'm just gonna, I think of things like, who can I be present for today? And sometimes, you know what, that's me. I'm on that list. I'm like, Anna, Anna needs you today. And this is what she needs you to do, you know, because she hasn't been on the list for a minute. But it might be my 16-year-old daughter, you know, and it might be that I just make her breakfast in bed on a Saturday and bring it up to her at 10 a.m. And she's like, oh, mom, thank you, you know, because she wasn't expecting it. And it's, it's just like, what you feed grows and that gives me that opportunity to really be what do i want to say intentional about what i want to grow in my life and not live accidentally one of the uh, i mentioned a motivational speaker named jim Rohn. uh one of the things he always says is and and you know it might have been zig ziglar now i think about it but anyway don't do something today because that's what you did yesterday you know, and, and you, you put a few of those together and you're years down the road and, and, and I'm, I'm guilty. I've, I've done that, whether it was eating a particular way or jobs or, or relationships. And, and, and so you, you talked about being intentional and I, and I think that's, um, it's, it's, it, I don't want to use the word cliche. It's, it's, it's real kind of hot, but it's, you know, I, I always say to my kids, cliches are cliches because they're true, right. you know, and that's absolutely stinking true. And, and, um, I, I always, I don't know if it's even related, but I like the, the story of the Peter and the wolf, they cry and they cry. And then that wolf shows up, yes. it showed up. And, and, and so, you know, the, the wolf is going to show up, whether it's now or, or, or later. And so we, we've got to, the, the, um, I, I, I feel like honestly, you know, low carb, high fat, 
carnivore because I probably like yourself, I'm probably more carnivore than keto, but but uh, uh, I literally feel like it was a get out of jail free card that God handed me yes. and just said, all right. And he, I don't think he's saying this is your last chance, but nobody's promised tomorrow. And so I, I feel like I took that and I, I punched that card. It doesn't mean I haven't made mistakes. It doesn't mean I haven't eaten stuff I'm not going to. It doesn't mean I won't. It's just, it, it's, it's just the overwhelming uh, uh, theme or, or, or habit I've sort of developed yes. is, is yes. one of, of health. And, you know, I got to say, I don't know where the saying came from. When I read it the first time, it said author unknown. And the saying is, life is not merely to be alive. It is to be awake. And something about that really hit me hard. Like we are so busy, like just being alive and just being about the business of being alive that we're, we very, very rarely are, you know, extraordinarily present. And I have to say that, you know, those close to the bone Italians, like your Nana, your Nona, my dad, you know, these are the people that, you know, my dad spoke Italian until he was eight years old. And then, you know, he was the kind of person that he looked you in the eyes when he was talking to you and he was fully present. Or my great aunt that just turned 106 yesterday. She wow. made you feel like you're the only person in the room, you know, and, and I, I don't do that, but I want to do that. I want sure. people that are around me. That's my goal in life. And to me, that's a good aspiration. That means that I'm living awake and I'm not living, you know, this kind of life that's self-absorbed and like I've got I've got things to do, like that rabbit, you know, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date, running around like All that right. all the time. Like when your daughter is only gonna be here for another year and a half, you know, <laughs> and then she's off to college in her own life or whatever. You, are, are we friends on Facebook? Did you read that or did you just say that? I just said I Oh, I just posted that yesterday, that exact thing that <laughs> I, God is my witness. My my oldest daughter is 17 and she's a senior and she has a big piano in her room and she goes down there and just plays and she was playing the theme song to uh, Downton Abbey, I think. And I just, I just, I, I got emotional thinking that there's, uh, there's probably, there's been times where I'm like, man, I can't wait till she goes off to college. I, not very often because I don't want her to leave at all. But I, I was basically just that there's such joy and pride and love. And then I, I was just saying that the parents don't wish for that to happen because it's, it's, it's coming. And it literally seemed like yesterday, she was uh, a month premature. And I just seems like yesterday, this little teeny tiny mask I put on her, on her nose right after she was born, it seems so like yesterday. And and it happens so stinking fast. I know that's not really what we're talking about. But no, we are talking about that. I, I truly believe that addicts are always like, you know, we want to like hurry up and get somewhere else until we're content, right? Like I'll be happy when, I'll be happy if, that's part of the disease of addiction. And what you're saying is when you look backwards, it's like, to me, life is like one big day and you just took a bunch of naps in between. Yeah. And, and yeah. It plays like that. So all of a sudden it seems like, all, where did all this time go? Because it seems like you just lived this one day and took a bunch of naps in between. And when we learn to really focus on what we've got and be grateful for what we've got and be grateful for hearing that music coming from downstairs, you know, to be um, grateful for my daughter who tells me everything, even things I don't want to know. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, you, all of those moments and cherishing them and, and being more present, that just, you know, that makes what we look back on filled with love and, and uh, satisfaction rather than regret and resentment. Right. You, you use the word happy win. And um, the, I, I think it was Jim Rohn again, but the, I say this every day. I say it to almost every person I run into there, these two things. I don't believe in happy. I believe in happier and then happy less. Right. And, and, and so I don't think you get to a spot and like, Oh, here I am. I'm happy because there's only two things that make us unhappy, not getting what we want and then getting what we want. Yep. And, and so strive for happier. Right. Yes. Because sometimes I think we get what we want and we were, we were really not prepared. What yes. we, we want and what we really 
um, need or what brings us contentment are two different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a gentleman on, um, I can't think of his name, but he's always talking about how he's taken a walk today. And today he took a walk for so many miles in the rain and he went keto and, you know, he's an older gentleman and he just makes me smile because everything he posts is so uplifting and positive. And I can tell he's very much living in the moment and enjoying right now and enjoying the journey and I think that that's a big thing you hear over and over again. Like you said, cliches are true, be, or they, they're repeated because they're true. And it's about the journey, not the destination. There really is no there. Tomorrow never comes. So if we don't, you know, focus on the here and now, that's, you know, and we start thinking, well, I need to lose, you know, for women, like I need to lose this amount of weight before my daughter's wedding or I'm going to feel like crap or whatever. Well, how about you just work on feeling good today and treating yourself and others well today. And then, you know, your family isn't going to remember. It's kind of like, you know, you can see I have a beautiful house. Well, I've been to, I bet I had one really good friend who was an absolute slob. I had to pull newspapers off of her, you know, like three weeks of newspaper off of her couch so I could have a place to sit at her house. But as soon as we sat down for a cup of coffee, all that went away. And it's the same thing. You meet somebody really pretty or interesting looking or whatever. And all that goes away when you start getting in a conversation with them. It's all background. Appearances are nothing. It's what's inside and what you allow to come out and come in. You know, and it's always, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So it's very important to protect your thinking and pay attention to your thinking. And that's what I think that little, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day can give us is an edge on, I'm going to decide how I think today. I get to make a choice. You know, I get, I can ask myself questions about how can I be of service? You know, what are the most important things I need to get done today? What's going to move the needle most for my business rather than getting stuck with a bunch of busy work. And then I, I'm more relaxed and I'm able to, to be present for my family. Well, the, we touched on it earlier when we talked on the phone um, that one of the speakers I listened to that, that talks about what am, not what am I getting, what am I becoming? And, and it, again, cliche, cliche, cliche. Used, I think saying the word is cliche now at this point, but, but uh, if you don't take that time to work on yourself and you don't get better, you're not, not only are you not helping yourself, but you're not helping your family. And um, I didn't, I didn't, we used the word wise earlier, or we talked about that. And one of the, again, the hot button things is you need to find your why. And, and one of the people that we know mutually, I kind of objected. I said, we have a million whys. There's a million reasons why. I've got two beautiful daughters. I've got a beautiful wife. I have sisters and I have uh, my parents and I have a 96 year old Nana who's catching up on your aunt, by the way, only 10 years to go. Right. And I, I have employees and I have uh, uh, just stuff, all kinds of crap I don't need. There's tons of reasons why. And um, the, the, what's funny is, is you, you said, don't be human doing, be a human being, but that's really what we need is to do sometimes. We do need to, we need, you need both, right? And so. You uh, try. Uh, that's my yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> but that that's is exactly right. I believe that motivation is overrated that what we need is to do something different. If, if we do what we did and we get what we got, that's literally insane. And it's not that, you know, insanity isn't necessarily like, one of my friends just said it to me this morning, but insanity is doing the, the same things over and over again and expecting different results. He said, it's not even expecting different results. It's absolutely knowing you're gonna get the same results when you do the same thing. Right. And you still do it that's absolutely insane. Why not do something different to be different? And that then gives you momentum. If you have, if you successfully go down from five soda pops a day to one, you know what? You should be jumping up and down and going right. crazy. And that's going to give you momentum to get rid of that one. And then momentum feeds that you know, it feeds that forward motion. And that's what momentum means. It means to move forward. And so doing creates momentum. And momentum is way more valuable 
principle of an asset than motivation. I am always motivated to do something tomorrow, 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 you know? I think you froze up. Uh, Lee Iacocca, he said, um, Lee, Lee Iacocca, I think it said that if you take some, if we're gone again, you how were, much do we lose there? That Lee Iacocca said, go ahead and start and That's as far as I got? Oh man, it was life changing. Everyone, would have, their lives would have been different. No, basically saying that, he says, if you have somebody that's on the wrong track, and, and I picture a train track, and one of those cars where you're pushing up and down, you know, yes. says, if someone's on the wrong, and you motivate them, they're just going to get to the wrong place faster. You know, it, it, it's more, you're right. I don't want to say motivation uh, isn't important, but momentum, it's, it's motivation's the wrong M. It's momentum for sure. And, and going in the right direction. That's, that's powerful. That's, that's what I said. Yeah. All right. Well, sir, I think that we have plenty here. Uh, we've been on for about an hour and 10 minutes. Of course, get two Italians together and we, you know, sit down and metaphorically get about it bread all day. Right. <laughs> Sure. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for giving me some time today and thanks for what you do. I look forward to helping you help other people and, and seeing you on Twitter. <laughs>